good. Wake up. Pay attention. Something good is coming your way. And I am serious. This is incredible stuff. It's about time we were able to find out more about what was going on with the CIA secret spy program. There's a new documentary coming out, Third Eye Spies. And this is a film that details the behind the scenes and what was happening, the remote viewings that they did at Stanford Research for intelligence agencies and what happened with those. And if you've ever listened to, I've had uh, interviews with Joe McMonigal and some other people who are the psychic spies are affiliated with them. And this stuff is fascinating, but there was still some stuff under wraps until this recent, um, I guess, unloading of CIA documents. So Lance is the director. Lance, and is it Mungia? Uh, yes, Mungia, that's right. Thank you for having me, Wendy. You're welcome. You're welcome. This is some, I have been fascinated this for a long time. And the, the, the stuff that was coming out, I read Ingo Swan's book, Penetration, uh, done a little research on Ingo and uh, followed along with Joe and uh, just stuff that we might believe was only science fiction. And they kept giving Yuri Geller such a hard time saying he was a fraud and all that good stuff. Um, I think Randy, amazing, amazing <clears throat> critic, um, gave him a hard time. And then when this comes out, it says, no, mm -mm, guess what? <laughs> it's legit. So thank you for putting this together. I, I, uh, I think it's going to give people a lot more insight into why there was an investment in this and, and, you know, maybe curious about what's happening now. So how did you get started and what, I mean, first your background, you're already, you, you're already a filmmaker. Yes. I, I, I've been a filmmaker for many years. Um, I started off uh, making a movie called Six String Samurai, which was uh, kind of a cult hit for, uh, you know, Lionsgate and Palm Pictures, uh, you know, in the late 90s. And then I went and did music videos for a while. And I did uh, um, a sequel to The Crow called The Crow Wicked Prayer. Um, and, um, you know, so, so I've, I've been around, around for a while and I, I kind of took a, a hiatus to, um, you know, do some other stuff. And then I uh, also run a... Um, a uh, public TV station, a nonprofit that does uh, educational television in um, in uh, the San Gabriel Valley, and uh, um, you know, was having lunch one day and with a, a, a client friend of mine, and um, she says, "Hey, there's this uh, um, friend of mine named Russell Targ who um, you know has a, a project that uh, um, you know you might be interested in, and would you be willing to look at it?" And I said, "You know, I had read some books on on uh, Russell Targ and the um, Stanford Research Institute." Uh, experiments in ESP that had been done, you know, um, years earlier. And I said, oh, you know, well, you know, if it's that Russell Targ, I said, absolutely. I said, you know, this that stuff's really interesting, and I'd love to talk to him. And so, um, you know, years, years earlier, I, I'd read an article in, believe it or not, Reader's Digest about an Army remote viewing program, you know, um, basically about a team of psychics working for the Army, spying on the Soviet Union, uh, you know, trying to get all of this... Uh, um, otherwise unattainable information by uh, mental powers alone. And, and I thought that was so interesting. I kept this article for years, and I finally lost it. But, um, but I was familiar with the program because of that. And, and uh, wound up, uh, you know, Russell called me from, from his home, and, and uh, we spent an afternoon talking, and it, it basically ended with um, him saying, hey, I'll, I'll fly out to L.A. And, and spend a weekend, and we can, you know, chat and figure out if there's a way to tell the story. And... Um, even with my background, knowing you know what, what I knew about the program, um, having been in film, having been kind of a uh, a student of of this type of stuff just as a hobby for a long time, um, I still was really really skeptical. You know, like my my nature is I I, I want to be discerning. I never want to be you know um, suckered into you know something that that isn't real. You know, um, like a magic trick. And and when he came out. Uh, you know, and we talked, and, and Russell is just like an, a walking encyclopedia of information, I mean, about this stuff. And, and he went on for two days, and, uh, you know, with just these incredible <laughs> stories of, of spies, you know, you know, doing all of these amazing things. And, and, and the whole time I'm thinking, you know, is, is this guy for really for real? I mean, because this stuff is even more incredible than I was led to believe. I mean, this is just incredible. I said, could this be somehow... Could he have been misled? Am I being misled? And then it, it took him two days to finally get to the part that said that um, all of this was uh, Freedom of Information Act now, you know, and, and that there had been congressional hearings about this. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, um, the intelligence committees uh, of, in, in Congress, uh, you know, had, had uh, held hearings. And that was all discoverable. 
and uh, and and I re- and I said, oh, wait a minute. I said, of of course. I said, this is the the the, the proof in the pudding here that the, that there's actually been um, you know legitimate discussions about this. And but the biggest thing, and the thing that really made me decide to do this film and devote an inordinate amount of time to to making this was that uh, when you look up the videos online, when you when you talk to people individually that had been involved with this program, uh, it, it sounds so incredible. And it's kind of like, does a tree in the forest make a sound when it falls if nobody's there to hear it? You know, it, it just, it, you, you don't believe it because it's so unbelievable. Uh, and, I, and I thought to myself, you know, all of these people have not been gathered in one, in one place together to tell their story. And, and some of them had never ever been on uh, film ever, you know, because some of them had been undercover working for CIA, uh, mm-hmm. working for DIA, you know, other other places, and and um, and hadn't told their story. So when uh, I really decided to do this, my pitch to the other people who had been involved was, you know, there's power in numbers, you know, and and when you talk about this story, you need to have the full weight of uh, of as many people that were involved as possible because um, otherwise it's just, uh, you know, one guy ranting to the storm, you know, um, that, that maybe is for real or maybe not. But when you really research it, you realize there were, you know, um, perhaps, you know, hundreds of, of people that, that that knew about this and were, were doing this. And, and uh, um, you know, when you look at the credits in my film, I'd say the vast majority of them have PhDs. You know, there's, I mean, we interviewed a Nobel Prize winner, you know, um, Edgar Mitchell, who's an Apollo astronaut. You know, like we we interviewed uh, people who really have devoted their lives scientifically to this. And that, to me, was really the catch, was, you know, I didn't want to just make a film, and neither did Russell, uh, that was um, woo-woo or or, um, out there, you know, talking about issues like, uh, you know, psychics with crystal balls and stuff like that. This is grounded scientific evidence for the reality of extrasensory perception and the fact that it's useful. And, and, and really, the kicker, the final thing that really made me want to do this was um, anybody can do it. You know, like this, this is the mantra that Russell Targ, who was the founder of the program, uh, used for so many years was that, you know, Everybody is psychic to a certain degree. You just need permission. You know, someone needs to tell you it's okay, that it's not scary, and that it's not, uh, you know, something that is um, uh, verboten somehow. It's, it's, it's just a part of being human. And, and, and that, to me, was really the kicker, you know, and, well, and I think that's why I wanted to do this. In some ways, people are already doing it. They just don't realize that's what it is because of that woo-woo concept. It's like, no, 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 don't buy into that. You're not psychic. You're just, you know, lucky. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, you know, somebody who's really great in sales and always knows what people want. You know, somebody who uh, is really great in business. You know, someone, uh, you know, and, and actually there, there's there been books written about that very subject. That like, like, for instance, there's a book on corporate ESP where, uh, it, you know, they interviewed CEOs and, and uh, people like that, you know, who were very successful, they found that they were using their intuition. They would get a gut feeling about knowing, was this deal a good deal or a bad deal? You know, like, and, it, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, um, and when I interviewed uh, um, the people who had been involved in this spy program, they uh, all pretty much told me that they never got any trouble from the high, the high higher-ups. You know the people at, at in cabinet positions, the 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 really really high ranking people. It was always the middle managers where they would get a lot of blowback and skepticism, and um, and th- that wouldn't believe this would work. It was because the because the people that were really successful in their in their jobs were used to taking risks. You know they were they were used to already using their intuition. Maybe they'd even had true sort of psychic experiences in life, and and that that allowed them to take the leap of faith that this could work. Yeah. One of the things I read about from Ingo Swan, he was meeting with one of the middle management guys, and the guy said, okay, I just need you to tell me. I really don't mind this psychic stuff. My boss has told me to talk to you, so I'm doing my, boss, I'm doing my boss's work, okay? So we're going to have a chat, and you're going to tell me what I want to know, and then you're going to get it gone. And Ingo says, okay, what do you want to know? I want to know if this psychic stuff is, is legit. Is, can a psychic do what you guys are saying? And he says, well, s- some psychics can. He said, well, good. So that really answers my question. You really can't do it. He says, okay, yeah, most, most can't, or maybe they're not able to. And he said, well, then, and said, um, I've answered your question. I'll leave. I'll get the heck out. I'm paraphrasing all this. And the guy goes, mm-hmm. 
and then he says to the guy, he says, but you're just as arrogant and inconsiderate. And one of those little guys who thinks he knows something and doesn't. And the guy goes, well, what do you mean? I didn't ask the right question. He said, no. So I'm, I'm done. He said, okay, well, would you like a beer? Is that a good question? Okay. So something like that, where the guy finally readdresses because Ingo is letting him know in <laughs> no uncertain terms um, that, yeah, I'll tell you whatever you want to hear. But if you want to hear the truth, then you're going to have to pay a little attention and have an open mind. And maybe I can give you some information that might surprise you. But that's kind of the brick wall they are up against when they're going in with the intelligence agency. And they survived, which that's, that should speak for itself. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to really sort of let the audience know, you know what this was, it, this was a, a program that was um, started at Stanford Research Institute in the early 1970s. And the, uh, it was started by Hal Putoff and Russell Targ. You know, who were both um, laser physicists, actually, who originally worked for, um, you know, the government studying lasers and got a grant to study ESP, extrasensory perception, at, at Stanford. And, uh, you know, it was this, the typical stuff. It was like the card tricks, like, read, tell me what's in the envelope, you know, like, and whatnot. And then they, they, they started working with a psychic by the name you, you know, Ingo Swan. You know, um, and Ingo was, was a, a professional psychic. Uh, who had come in for this study they were doing on uh, studying psychic abilities. And um, he got very frustrated. He said, why do you want me to look at what's at the, you know, you know, on the card or, or in the envelope? If you want to know what's in the envelope, open the envelope and you know, just read it. He says, I, I can look anywhere in the world with my psychic abilities. Why, why do you need to um, have me look, do stupid card tricks? Uh, mm -hmm. Send somebody out you know, um, to hide someplace, and I'll tell you, I'll describe the location where they're at. And, and uh, both Russell and, and Hal had never heard of anything like that. They were very skeptical. But on coffee breaks, they decided to humor him and, you know, send somebody out to go get co coffee. And then Ingo would tell them, um, you know, exactly, you know, the, the details of, of the location. They found again and again he was getting it right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that was an eye-opener, you know, for them. And uh, they brought other people into the program. Another one was by the name of Pat Price. Uh, you know, who, who became one of their most famous psychics who could do the same thing. And uh, he was hired they, away they, by the CIA. He was eventually hired away by the CIA. That's yes, right. They, they actually eventually closed the SRI program um, proper, the one that was at Stanford uh, you know, University at the Research Institute, and uh, did that intentionally to hire their best psychic, who was Pat, you know, um, into their program, you know, and, uh, and Ingo actually went on to become the trainer of psychics for the U.S. Army, believe it or not, you know, because the U.S. Army at Fort Meade had a unit of, of people that they were training to use the technique that they developed with Ingo at, at Stanford uh, to, uh, to spy on the Soviet Union. And this went on for 20 years, you know, for, for 20 years until 1995, uh, the U.S. government had multiple agencies using remote viewing, you know, which, which is what the, the, the term was coined uh, for being able to see a location outside of time and space by simply closing, closing your eyes and describing the unexpected images of what your target was. And, and they found that they could do this in the laboratory using nothing but a set of coordinates. You know, they, they could use longitude and latitude, and that was really the the breakthrough that made this a useful spying technique. You know, they, they uh, would, would sit there and say, you know, give me, you know, here's longitude and latitude, these numbers, what do you describe there? What do you see? And, and uh, they would draw things. You know, they would sit there, close their eyes, uh, and they would get, you know, everybody has this happen. You close your eyes and maybe you get just some unexpected random images, you know, that flash through your brain. And you, so you don't discount those images. You know, most people just discount them. But, you know, because there's a, a link to where you're looking psychically, you write the stuff down on a piece of paper. Maybe you draw a little schematic or uh, something like that. You know, so maybe you'll pick up smells. Maybe you'll pick up um, someone's emotional feelings at the site. Uh, you know, but you'll, ne you'll never get a flashing sign that says he's at Macy's on Fifth Street. You know, it, it's, it's not that simple. But, it's, uh, but, if, but for the really, really good people, the one in a million people, you know, maybe it's close to that good, you know, um, well, but, but what Russell would say is, again and again, is simply just close your eyes, tell me what the most unexpected things you see about where, uh, you know, um, your friend Bill is hiding right now, and, and, uh, um, and then write that down. 
and it's and they right. found that statistically they could give that information to an uh, a judge that knew nothing about the the uh, the whole event, uh, and and that judge could look at the uh, either photographs of the site or actually go to the site and match the drawings and the descriptions again and again and again in a way that statistically was impossible, you know. And they did that all in a laboratory setting, and then one day. Somebody from the CIA shows up at their doorstep and, and says, uh, hey, you know, uh, we think all this ESP stuff is bunk. You know, we don't, we don't really believe this stuff, but we're worried a little bit about it because the Soviet Union is spending an inordinate amount of resources studying this and actually potentially using this. You know, there's, there were 70 different laboratories all over the Soviet Union in the early 1970s that were studying ESP. And, and not just actually ESP, they were studying um, more um, offensive techniques, like can psychic ability be used to harm machinery or people, you know, like those, those types of things. And what they had found in the laboratory at SRI was that it's incredibly hard or impossible to actually affect a person, you know, or to actually do something that was offensive, but, but that it was incredibly easy to do things that were passive, like find out information. You know, and, and that really, there were no secrets. There was nothing that they really couldn't focus on and at least find something out about. And, and uh, so when the CIA guy heard that uh, they were uh, using coordinates, you know, that they could actually use coordinates, that they developed this technique, he said, uh, he said oh, I'm going to give you some coordinates, and if you can tell me what's at this coordinate, we'll fund you. You know, and, and if you can't, then I'll know that, you know, this, there's nothing to this and we don't have to really worry about it. So they gave these coordinates to Pat Price and to Ingo Swan independently, who were in independent locations and didn't know that the other had been given the coordinates. Um, they, both come back, they both came back with this description of a, of a uh, very military-like base that was underground and there were like something like old missile silos and, uh, you know, they both gave, gave schematics of the buildings and... Um, you know, described huge radar dishes and all of these things. And uh, the scientists looked at the two descriptions and they said, well, it's interesting that it's similar, but we don't know what it is. You know, it's not, you know, um, one of them, Pat Price, even named uh, code words and the, the name of the site and uh, names of people that worked at the site. He, he really went over time with it. And it was actually the first thing that they had officially given to Pat. Pat was a brand new psychic at SRI at that time. And, uh, they sent all this off to the CIA, and uh, you know, Kit Green, who was their their uh, contact there at the CIA at the time, you know, who had asked this question, had gotten this paperwork, and he looks at it, and and he and he kind of laughs, and he says, you know, well, this is total bunk because I didn't give them some secret military base; I just gave them, uh, you know, the coordinates to my buddy's cabin out in the woods in in Virginia, mm-hmm. you know, and and he called Russell and he told him that, and and Russell said, oh, well, that's. That's too bad. He says, That's really too bad. He says, but isn't it interesting that they both got the same result? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and Kit says, oh, wait, you're, you're right. They, they did. That is, that is interesting. And he says, no, well, well, it's too bad it didn't work out. We had some initial, they did, they did a few smaller things before that, and they'd done well, but not with this one. And then Kit sat there and thought about it all weekend, and he went, you know, it's not too, too uh, um, far from where his office was at in Langley, you know, so let me... I'm going to get in the car and just take a drive out in the woods. And uh, so he, he, he took a drive, went to the cabin, and um, on the way up there, he, he looks out and there's these big, huge radar dishes off in the distance, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe a few miles you know, out. And, and so he uh, does a little research and he finds out that, that this is an NSA site. You know? and, and so he uh, doesn't know much about it, but he sends the information off to the NSA. He says, hey, is there any truth to this? The next day, FBI, you know, NSA, the heads of the CIA, everybody's in Kit's office saying, why is the CIA spying on the NSA? <laughs> they nailed it. They nailed what was at this site, you know, which was called Sugar Grove, uh, you know, which was the most secret um, NSA listening post that they had uh, mm-hmm. to spy on Soviet satellites. You know, and and uh, and that that site was incredibly classified for many many years. It was just recently decommissioned, and and uh, they got the layout, the schematic of it, uh, the fact that there were uh, levels underground, um, and and Pat Price basically walked through the site 
uh, you know, he, he said that, you know, in his imagination, he would stick his head inside filing cabinets mm-hmm. and, and then he would pull out names of, of people working there and operations that were going on there. And, and he got the code words of the operations correct. You know, they mm-hmm. were all named after, uh, you know, pool terms like, uh, you know, um, eight ball and, you know, you know, cue ball and stuff like that. And, and, and those names themselves were classified top secret, special access code words, you know, which, is, which is incredibly classified, and he got it right. And, and, and Kit, you know, reported all of this. Uh, this went up the chain of command and created a huge stir in CIA. Yeah. Yeah. And that started it. Yeah. It would be frightening for, for them. <laughs> it was that it, obvious. It was. Easy. Yes, yes, it was. And, and, and uh, you, you know, because you, you don't, you know, there there was a um, always a suspicion in CIA uh, in those early days that that this was somehow that they were somehow being duped. But on the other hand, they had to take it very seriously that they weren't being duped. You know, and uh, because if this guy could could look inside and get code words on on a top secret you know project, you know, could he get nuclear codes? You know, could could he tell you tell you what the president's agenda is going to be the next day? You know, like what. Well- the other question is, if the Soviets were doing it and they were ahead of us, then couldn't they get there too? That's right. And, and, and uh, you, you know, the, the Soviets had a long history of studying this stuff. I mean, you, you know, the, the, uh, the roots of shamanism started in the mountains of Siberia. You know, like they, they had, uh, you know, sort of had that ingrained in their culture for many years. And, and, um, this became a very big deal in Russia, but, but it was, um, you know, they, they were much more interested in sort of the mechanisms, like how it worked and, and could it be used offensively, you know, um, and, and that was really what, what the, uh, the CIA was worried about. And, and you know, the, the, the CIA had, had brought in people like Uri Geller, you know, to be studied at Stanford Research Institute very early on, you know, like once they developed this kind of relationship with SRI. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Uri Geller supposedly could bend spoons. You know, he could he could uh, affect electronics and things like that. Yeah. And you know, they never, but they never found that at SRI. Actually, you know, they never they never actually uh, allowed or or had Uri do that in uh, controlled laboratory circumstances at SRI. He could bend spoons all day long at lunch. You know, but but once they put him in the laboratory, he wasn't able to do it. But what he could do is the same thing that their other subjects could do, which is remote view. You know, he, you know, he could tell them, uh, you know, um, where things were hidden and, and, and those types of things. And, and um, I actually believe, I have a whole theory behind that. I think that, uh, um, you know, that, that the observer effect is, is a really big factor in, in how this type of stuff works. Because when you're working with consciousness, and, and you're looking to observe a phenomenon, the, the thoughts and the emotions of the observer can actually also affect the experiment. Yes. You know, and, and this is something that's been proven again and again in the laboratory, that, that uh, you know, the, it's impossible when you know this information to have a true double-blind study. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you can't do it statistically because, you know, this, this is an effect that, that deals with the big sort of um, elephant in the room, which is consciousness. You know, you know, consciousness is is not just a, a a factor of the human brain that is a chemical thing that can be measured. Uh, you know, that we're talking about something that is very, very hard to pin down. It's elusive. It's you know, partially our imaginations and the way that we perceive the world, and and that is why that this does not become a more mainstream discipline. You know, like I've I've really racked my brain over the last couple of years to figure out why it is that that mainstream science. Uh, doesn't touch these issues of, of psychic ability. And, and as a filmmaker, it, you know, it, it became really apparent to me that, that uh, there's a stigma, number one. You know, like it's, it's very, um, you know, and I think actually that the stigma even has been reinforced by certain, you know, parties that, that like this being a very kind of a niche. Absolutely. On purpose. Yeah. This stuff, when it's, war- when it's real and you're good at it, you are a threat. Yeah, and 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 so uh, that's one, and and then two. There's just this dogma, you know. You know, the the big villain in this film is dogma. 
You know, it's the the, the fact that that uh, you know an authority figure tells you something is correct, and you're expected to believe it whole cloth. You know, and and uh, you know I don't expect people to believe everything that I say, and and you know we should we should have a healthy dose of, of skepticism when it comes to uh, things that are are unexplained. But but that is what science is. You know, like good science asks big questions. It asks questions. Um, about things that we don't understand, you know. Hold on, and... hold on, Lance. We're gonna have to take a break. Okay. Okay. Lance sure. He's the producer director of the new film coming out, Third Eye Spies. Okay, looking for some representation, a little bit of funding, and uh, wider distribution. Okay, so if you can do that, or know someone who can, spread the word. An incredible Absolutely. story. And and we're gonna name a few names of the folks you talk to. Coming up next, this is Conscious Living Power. You know. You wanted to see me? Yes, please, have a seat. So here's the thing. When this company brought you on, we took a chance on you. You didn't have that four-year college degree we typically look for. Right. But we gave you a shot anyway. And since then, you've worked incredibly hard and given it your all. Thanks. You've been an important asset to the team, but I don't think you can be an intern here anymore. (sighs) We want to hire you. You're... You're serious? Absolutely. Find your next great employee. Introduce yourself to the grads of life. Who are they? Talent worth knowing about. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. I won't let you down. I know. Don't miss out on a resource many innovative companies have already discovered. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. So you see, son, good manners are very, very important. Someday, many years from now, when you're a grown-up, you'll be a man. And when you are, you should be a gentleman. Do you want me to go through it one more time? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Exactly. Always say please, thank you, you're welcome, and excuse me. Sit up straight, hold doors open for ladies. If a door's shut, then knock first. Don't burp, don't swear, don't speak with your mouthful, don't reach across people's plates, keep your elbows off the table. What table? And don't interrupt. While we're at it, don't stare, don't use foul language, don't call people names, but do remember people's names. Always share your toys, play nice, and cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. On the bus, give up your seat to anyone who has trouble standing. Bottom line, treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Got it? Got it. And stop picking your nose. Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But spending just two minutes twice a day making sure they brush their teeth is easier and could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. For fun two-minute videos to watch while brushing, visit 2min2x.org. That's 2min2x.org. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ag Council. There's hundreds of fun and simple things you and your family can do to live a healthier lifestyle. Here's 20 of them. Walk to work, walk the dog, have the dog walk you, take a hike, take a bike, skate, dance, hop, jump, do the Humpty Hump, skip seconds, skip dessert, skip, skip, skip to Malou, don't skip breakfast, drink H2O, lower your sodium, raise the roof, shake your booty, stock up in vegetables, and don't forget to eat them. (sighs) Search We Can online to find more ways you and your family can get healthy together. A message from the Ad Council, HHS, and NIH's We Can program. If a disaster struck right now, what would you and your family do first? Would your kids know what to do? How would you get in touch with them if you're separated and your cell phone isn't working? Don't wait until a disaster strikes to figure it out. It's your responsibility to make a plan for you and your family ahead of time. To learn how, take our readiness challenge at nyc.gov slash readynewyork or call 311 for information. Brought to you by the New York City Office of Emergency Management and the Ad Council. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Wendy Garrett. This is a Conscious Living um, special spy edition. Psychic spies. This is, this is, I mean, I'm telling you, if you're listening right now, we are just getting on the very teeny tiny tip of this stuff. If you really get into the information, you'll find um, names like Uri Geller and Joe McMonagle. And just to give you a clue before we get back to Lance here real quick, Uri Geller, if you do the math on this, find out what he talks about in terms of the Battle of Entebbe. And how they were able to get a plane through airspace that was supposedly extremely high security and not register on the radar. That's a fascinating subject. Joe McMonagall just recently, in terms of the stuff that they declassified in the Miami Herald, says they haven't declassified any of the stuff that works. 
it's all garbage. Okay, well, that's, and he's known as one of the grill flame psychics. Anyway, I'm, we'll get so much more information as this stuff continues to come out. But right now, this is an excellent film. It's coming out and it gives you some of the details and the people behind the scenes and what was going on with all of that psychic research. Russell Targ is in it. And right now, Lance, who is, I'm going to, sh- I'm going to see you get hopefully big accolades on this one because it's it's definitely information that has um, finally found a time to get out amongst the mainstream. Lance Magia, he's um, got a nice background in terms of being fluent in his ability to create a film, and this one has a little extra slam dunk going with it. It's CIA. It's fascinating. Hi, Lance. I'm I'm just I have to give you a little bit more props. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, Wendy. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, you said just recently that Joe is in, in the in Miami Herald. How long ago? I, it looks like. Oh, well, let me grab that one real quick. I think it was the tenth of February. Um, oh, wow. Wow. And that's so. It's recent. Let me see what it's what I've got here. I mean, February tenth, twenty seventeen. I've been seeing more on this that they they're they're going through these files. You know, everybody. I've seen them. I've got the CIA website, the stuff, and I've. It is tedious. So to go through, it, and- it is incredibly tedious, and and you know Joe McMonagle was the best remote viewer that the Army had, you know, like because it, you know Stanford Research Institute developed many different contracts with other people, and you know at at first, um, you know they worked just with the CIA. The CIA actually tried to shut them down and and bring the program in just internally, you know, like once once it they knew that it worked, uh, but um, they also had contracts with other. Uh, elements of the government as well, one of which being the Army, which they had a 20-year you know, relationship with, with Defense Intelligence Agency, and, and uh, Joe McMonagall was a, um, a chief warrant officer um, you know, in, in the Army and, and uh, became one of their best psychics that Russell and, and uh, Hal put off trained mm-hmm. uh, you know, to, to do this uh, service for the, for the U.S. military. And um, the stuff that he did was incredible. And, and, and what you know, Joe McMonagall had had a uh, near-death experience. You know, he, and and that had he, he credited to uh, you know giving him sort of a heightened sense of his own intuition in Vietnam. He was always the guy that uh, others would want to be point. They they wouldn't want to follow into the minefield because he just knew where all of the um, booby traps were. You know, like and and actually, when they did the army program, they looked for guys like that. They looked for guys that were well respected by their peers and that had kind of an uncanny sense of um, where the danger lie. You know, and 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 uh, and the other thing that Joe had going for him was he was a wonderful artist. You know, he yes. he just he he was a cartoonist. He could draw, you know, um, stuff. And I have seen drawings that are that are public now that that, that Joe McMonagall has done uh, that are just uncanny to to the uh, to the target sites that he was tasked on finding. You know, mm-hmm. they they did a uh, experiment once at the Liver- Lawrence Livermore Labs in in Palo Alto, uh, and um, Joe drew this just almost photorealistic, um, you know, picture of the target, you know, of, of, of the site and, you know, said, oh, that's Lawrence Livermore Labs. You can see it. You know, it, it's, it's, it's uncanny what the human mind is, is really capable of. And, and that, that, again, really was why I wanted to make this film. But, but I also find that it's uncanny the amount of information that's out there. You know, there's, there's so much stuff out there. When you talk about these freedom of information, you know, kind of dumps that they've done, you know, this whole thing was declassified um, in '95. Uh, you know, um, it, it was actually originally marked automatic do not downgrade. You know, usually the CIA declassifies stuff after 25 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Russell was chomping at the bit to tell his story about uh, you know being the scientist behind this for years, and and he would he he was petitioning the CIA. Uh, to release um, documents rel- related to cases that he had he had um, studied and and been a part of operationally, and and uh, they would not do it. You know, they would not respond. You know, he he had uh, his son, who was a lawyer for the um, Interior Department, um, actually at one point, um, you know, helping him try to get this stuff declassified. And they actually wound up having to go to Congress people and uh, and others um, to help them. Um, kind of shame the CIA into releasing these documents, and and in 1995 they finally did, uh, you know, um, release some documents, um, and he got sort of the juicy stuff that he wanted. But then that same year they released 70,000 other documents. You know, um, they they just they poured out so much stuff because I, mean, I think that there's a certain kind of a technique where 
uh, you know, if you don't want somebody to focus on one piece of paper, you release, you know, 100,000 of them. You, you don't, you know, and yeah. you have to sift through all of it. And, and I know I was just reading an article recently where this stuff was only on, I think, like, you know, four computers in some library where you had access to it. It wasn't on the Internet. Yeah. You know, um, and, and so you really didn't have access to all of it unless you really took the time to go to this one location and sift through 70,000 documents. And, and just recently, they've started putting all of it up online now. And, 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 uh, and even then, yeah. like Joe says, they haven't released everything. There's so much more stuff. You know, um, one of the interviews that we did was with uh, Ken Kress, who, who was the original uh, CIA uh, program manager for this. Um, he was a physicist, and he was undercover for many, many years. He was an undercover uh, agent for the CIA, you know, like working as a physicist and, and not telling anybody he, he worked at CIA. And uh, he has never come forward for an interview, you know, never, ever been, you know, he, he had written an article in the Annals of Intelligence, which was the uh, CIA sort of like uh, publication, you know, like for, uh, you know, regarding some of the stuff that they had done with Pat Price internally in CIA many years ago, which, which he later then uh, did a follow-up article to that, that uh, um, he was sort of uh, very upset at Pat Price because of some, some things we can talk about later that, that Pat had done in, in his mind. Um, but uh, he'd never done an interview, you know, and, and uh, we convinced him to do an, an interview for this. And uh, um, it was just fascinating. And, and, uh, and each question, I had to submit questions to him ahead of time. That was submitted to CIA, and they had to approve his responses. And, wow. and there was a whole group of other stuff that he wanted to talk about that he, wouldn't, he couldn't even tell me about. He said, oh, there's all this other stuff I want to talk about, and I don't know if it's been officially declassified. And it mm-hmm. had not you know, declassified. It, it, it was never declassified. So, um, so there's stuff still that he can't talk about today. And that's the thing, is that this stuff is so deep. And even um, going back to the article that I had uh, referenced before, the way that, that this stuff is set out, there are people who do know, and it's kind of a trickle-down or you know, piecemeal. September 4th, 1979, psychics pinpointed the location of a missing plane to within 15 miles. Details of that search are blacked out in CIA documents, but Jimmy Carter, president at the time, could have been alluding to it in an interview he gave about 12 years ago. And he t- talks about this, saying, uh, had a plane go down in the Central African Republic, twin engine plane, small, couldn't find it, even with satellite photography. So the director of the CIA came and told me he had contacted a woman in California who claimed to have supernatural abilities, went into a trance, wrote down latitudes. We sent our satellite over the latitude and longitude. There was a plane. Okay, so this is stuff that's happened, and that was 1979. Yeah, that, that was 1979, um, and that is actually a, a pretty big part of our film, that, that one episode that you just described. Um, and we actually have Carter um, on audio uh, recounting that whole story. Excellent. And, yeah, yeah, we have him on audio. And he, and he tells the story in a page um, in his new biography that just came out, My Life. Uh, okay. You know, that, that uh, um, uh, you know, just came out, I think, last year. You know, um, we actually got Russell with uh, Jimmy Carter signing his book, you know, which was great, you know, when he yes. came out to California, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, funny enough, I, I was interviewing Dale Graff. Dale Graff uh, was one of the uh, heads of um, the DIA program, you know, um, Defense Intelligence Agency program for years. And he was uh, also a physicist and, uh, you know, came into this very skeptically and then became sort of... Um, a real uh, fan of, of this technique because it worked. And then one of his biggest successes was finding that bomber, that, that, that down bomber in the jungle that, that Carter references. Uh, you know, this technique of, of remote viewing, you know, um, like I said, they, they can just say, hey, we lost a bomber. Uh, it's somewhere in this area. Where is it? And they gave this to two psychics, at, at uh, one at Stanford Research Institute and one um, at, at DIA where, where Dale was. And um, they both came back with very good descriptions of, of where this down bomber was. Uh, and they forwarded that up to um, Carter, you know, and, and, uh, and they went and they looked there. This was a, this was a really a, a new Russian bomber that had um, very sensitive electronic equipment on it that both the, the Soviets and the CIA wanted very badly, you mm-hmm. know, and neither one of them could find it. So there were competing teams in the jungle looking for this at the time. And, um, 
and because of the jungle canopy where it had crashed, they couldn't find it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Dale actually went to the, to the site where, where they were looking and went to the command post and there's this big wall with all these maps on it. And he takes the drawing that this um, one particular lady and, and had made uh, of, of a kind of a winding river and jungle and, and he puts it up against their map and it matches. And, wow. and, and, uh, and she had marked a particular place on that river where it was and she said, look there. And, and they were looking, they'd been looking totally in the wrong place. And, and they, uh, they flew out there and there was, um, they, they could see from the helicopter, there were natives coming out of the jungle with pieces of metal. And, and so they landed in a clearing and there it was, you know, the bomber was, was there. And, and, uh, um, and that was something that was documented in, um, the minutes of the, uh, uh the, uh, chairman of the air force, you know, um, had, had given a, a, a meeting to his board to say that, you know, that they had found this bomber using the help of, uh, of, of a psychic at SRI, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, um, Carter related this story. He, you know, he, he goes to Emory university every year and he gives a speech to the students there. And, uh, in 95, he was there giving this speech. And, and one of the students asked him, what's the weirdest thing you ever saw as president? And Carter said, uh, you know, well, weirdest thing I ever saw was that there was this um, bomber we couldn't find and we gave it to a psychic and she gave us coordinates and we looked there and there, there it was. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he didn't realize didn't he was it. outing a still top secret program in 1995. Yes. Like, oops. Yeah. Oops. To CNN, you know, to others, you know, oh, yeah, and, CNN might tell. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, what wound up happening was that, that uh, this came out, became a big story. You know, in the news, oh, you know, president hires psychics, whatever. And, and the CIA then had to scramble and do damage control because um, the, the overriding concern for all of these government agencies again and again and again through the interviews that I've done was that this was something they were petrified of getting uh, the um, Golden Fleece Award. You know, the, the, the Golden Fleece Award in government, the, you know, is the award for the stupidest government program that's fleecing the American people for their money. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah, and... Toilet seat. Yeah, right. The golden toilet seat, and and uh, and so they, the CIA, commissioned a quote unbiased report called the AIR report to um, figure out whether or not this had ever actually worked. You know, in in 1995, after Carter had come out with this revelation, uh, and um, they did this study, and they very quickly determined that uh, this had never been used operationally, wasn't any good, didn't work. And um, and then they closed the DIA program because they had been handed back the DIA program to run actually just right at that same time, and and uh, and they closed it. You know, and <laughs> one of the two judges that that uh, we interviewed, one of the two judges of that report, um, Jessica Utz, who's the head of the American Statistical Association and a um, and a dean at um, uh, oh gosh, I forget the college, but one of the one of the state colleges here uh, in in California, and. Uh, she said that uh, um, she actually looked at all of the, the, the statistics of all of the psychic studies that had been done in 100 years, you know, and, and she found that the efficacy and the, the rate of success of these studies and things that had been done uh, were better than the efficacy for aspirin, you know, like the, you know in terms of like the, the statistical effect. You know, she found a very real effect. Um, and she told me that they were never allowed to interview any of the operational remote viewers. They, they didn't interview a single remote viewer that was working for the government. They never interviewed Russell. They never interviewed Hal. You know, they didn't interview because by that point, both of them, both of them had left the, uh, the program. Uh, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, Ed May, who, who was running the program for uh, the SRI at the time and for the DIA, uh, was not allowed to give any data at all supporting the program. You know, um, and, and so without interviewing any of the operational remote viewers, they said that they'd never used it operationally and didn't work, wasn't any good. And then they canceled the program. Yeah, disinformation, mm -hmm. basically. Well, they, they were, I think a lot of it was embarrassment. You know, um, you know now did, did it continue? It ended the relationship with SRI. You know, um, did, did it continue in some other form? We don't know. You know, but I'm sure uh -huh. I mean, it works. They'd be kind of dumb not to. Uh, yeah, I think they just went off record. Yeah. 
that's yeah. my own my own suspicion is that you, when you get something that's good and you get too much publicity, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. So you better figure out how to way to get it out from under the microscope of public opinion, so you can actually. Mm-hmm. But it's like you're saying when earlier when people who are skeptics enter the se- enter the scene, then you you eliminate some of your potential hits. You 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 um somehow that negativity is like uh, it absorbs the positive energy and you watch this with energy workers and you see that. So I'm, I'm putting that over on this people like James Randi, who says nothing is real, but then he also stages his little test results to make sure that nothing is real. You can't do that. Well, you know, have, James well, Randi is an interesting case because I watched uh, you know, his, his, his film and uh, yeah. you know, he talks briefly about Russell and Hal and he, in the context of Uri Geller and, and he makes it sound as if, um, everything that Russell and Howell was doing was relating to spoon bending and you know telekinesis, yes. bending metal, and and that and that uh, you know it didn't work for the government, and then they went off on a tour of the world with Eric Geller or something like ridiculous like that, which is completely false and easily nice. you know provable as as false uh, because and he never mentioned the phenomenon of remote viewing because you can't really <laughs> debunk the phenomenon of remote viewing, you know, metal bending and things like that are, are, are very, very hard to prove in a laboratory setting, you know, but, and they've, and there's been a lot of sort of um, attempts that have failed to do that, but, yeah. but that's not psychic ability. I mean, you know, proving um, something like remote viewing it is statistically much easier to do because, you know, there's so many uh, tasks that can be given that are just impossible to, you know, um, fake. You know, and and uh, and that's what they found again and again. And and you know, for for 20 years, the government paid SRI about a million dollars a year. Um, you know, the the army program cost far far more than that. Um, y- you know, and the arm the government doesn't fund things year over year based on failures. They do it based on success. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and uh, you know, in 1995, uh, when this program was canceled, um, Joe McMonagall and uh, Ed May uh, and um, others went on Nightline and, and uh, um, would talked about the things that they could talk about at the time. And, uh, and uh, Bob Gates, you know, Secretary of Defense, uh, you know, under Obama and Bush and, and uh, at the time head of the CIA, you know, director of the CIA, went on there and, and he talked about how uh, it, it just never worked operationally and wasn't any good. You know, it was something they had played with, but it was better researched out in public and not with the CIA. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because it, Joe McMonagall tells the story that actually uh, their biggest client in the Army w- w- was uh, the CIA. This was after the original, the official CIA program had ended. Um, the CIA was a, a, a huge client of the Army remote viewers, and, and, the, and, the, and McMonagall told me that he worked personally uh, with Gates uh, you know, in finding this, um, you know, brand new typhoon class submarine that the the, the Russians had uh, developed, um, you, you know, they they were building this thing in this giant building several miles from the seacoast, uh, you, you know, in in some Soviet city, and the uh, U.S. intelligence didn't know it was inside the building. And over a period of weeks, uh, Joe did all of these remote viewings where he was describing what he thought were like big giant submarines and. Uh, everybody said he was crazy that, that the submarine couldn't be that big. It was like three times bigger than any other submarine ever built. And mm-hmm. and uh, um, he told them they were going to launch the submarine in 120 days. And uh, and Gates approved um, monitoring the site. You know, um, and and 114 days later they they rolled out. They dug a ditch to the ocean and they rolled out this giant submarine bigger than anybody had ever seen with the bay doors open and everything. And and uh, because Gates had ordered the satellites to take pictures of it during that period, um, they got more intel on that submarine than they'd gotten on the entire fleet before that. Uh-huh. So, so this was incredibly useful at the time, and, and, and Gates was directly involved. So I, so, and, then he, and then he goes on Nightline and says, oh, it never worked. Because but the headline, the headline is what people bought, and that's a real, real clue right now to the way the news works. If you can get that headline out there, that's what people remember, and everything else is just flotsam. It, it's incredible the way our um, media, and th- it's, it's a very effective tool for sometimes disinformation and getting people off the real story. And thankfully, that's what you're doing. You're bringing back some pieces of the puzzle to say, okay, before you write this off, and before you listen to the higher ups who are saying, "Go away, go away, go away," take a closer look, and here are the people who did it, and maybe you should listen to them. 
Yeah, I, I think another uh, really good uh, way to look at this is, is through the lens of Russia today. You know, like the, the, the Soviet Union uh, prized this stuff. They, they, uh, they prized the researchers who had studied it. You know, there were, there were researchers studying it for, for many years um, at one point. At one point, I understand that they, they would give a, a kind of a covert ESP test to every draft age male coming into the Army uh, to, to find out who, who had uh, ability and they could work with. Yeah. And, and uh, that was back then, you know, th- this was considered, you had people like Nina Kalagana, who, who was this famous Russian psychic and, uh, you know, others like that. And um, now, uh, you know, we interviewed a, a Ukrainian uh, scientist uh, who was, uh, he was, he was in the U S for a conference and um, he publishes papers in Ukraine under an assumed name, because if he published a paper uh, in using his real name, that he, his other scientific work would not be taken seriously, you know. Oh, yeah. And and he he told me that that in the in the former Soviet Union, in the former Soviet states, and in Russia, um, the entire subject is forbidden. Like like they just uh, you know the the government frowns upon it in the extreme. They deny that they ever had any kind of part in it. Uh, you know they they don't even really allow books out. You know, um, on the subject matter, uh, you know, um, a lot of books have been banned, you know, that, that, that talk about that era and, and that the average citizen in, in, in Russia today doesn't know anything about it. And there's so much misinformation, you know, um, and, 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 a, and a technique that is often used is you just put out too much information. You put out so uh-huh. many, you, you, put, you put out so many, uh, uh, you know, um, pillars of smoke. That you, you don't yeah. know where the fire is, you know, and, and, and I think that's just sort of a typical, you know, intelligence technique that, that, that I think is, is easy to use is you, just, you create so much chaos and, and uh, you know, no one's ever going to sit there and read as many documents as it takes to get through it. And, and so what if there's a few people out there kind of talking about it, you know, they're, they're not credible, you know, unless they're put into context. I know, the context unless they have a PhD. Uh, so, so, well, okay, I'll tell you what, just because we're going to move forward and try and, and promote people coming to see the show, you have a list of people that you've talked to, and you mentioned a couple who have never actually gone public before. This stuff is still coming to light because of the volumes of information now available that was that latest data dump from the CIA. Um, what else, in terms of getting this thing going forward, do you need help with? Well, I mean, you know, we need we need support in terms of just uh, expectation that the film is is coming out because I think the more people that expect it, the more you know it's going to uh, really help the film. You know, <clears throat> we're still looking for some um, some uh, you know distribution. You know, like we've met with a few distributors and uh, we're still putting the finishing touches on the film. But um, you know, I'm definitely interested in meeting with uh, distributors and you know we may be hitting some festivals you know next year um, or, or late this year uh, and. You know, it's, it's so, so really, you know, my main thing is coming up is going to be meeting with distributors, you know, like that's, that's the, uh, you know, we're looking for, you know, we're investigating a lot of different, uh, you know, ways of getting this out, you know, and, uh, you know, my goal, and I know Russell's goal, who's also the producer of this film, uh, is to get this seen as widely as possible, you know, get this seen by a lot of people, because, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff that needs to be seen, and it's not just needs to be seen to expose some government program, to me, that's, that's fun, but it's not the purpose of the film. The purpose of the film is to talk about who we are as human beings. You know, like, what, what is it that we are capable of? And, that, and that's the thing that I felt was so credible in the making of this film, is that there were a lot of credible people in it. You know, we flew to England, and we spoke with um, Brian Josephson, who's a Nobel Prize winner uh, at uh, Cambridge you know, um, university there in, in, in England. And, uh, you know, he has spent his life, uh, you know, talking about this stuff. I mean, he, he, he won a Nobel prize for, uh, discovering quantum tunneling, you know, he, and, and he has a whole theory on how, you know, you know, this stuff may work. And, and, um, just the fact that he talks about this stuff makes him, uh, makes it difficult for him to get funding for other things. You know, he, he told me a story about how, you know, uh, people will come to, uh, you know, projects that he's in and they'll, and they'll tell the other people, you know, like, we'll fund you, but we won't work with anybody other than Josephson, you know, because yeah. he's spent some time, you know, um, talking about these subjects. And, and so, so these are things that should not be, uh, you know, um, 
forbidden or scary, you know, subjects to talk about because they they are not they are not something that's out in the realm of you know ghosts and goblins. This is scientific. Human, you know, these are things yeah, that are real. Are abilities. And they, these are abilities. I like the way Ingo Swan says: true skepticism does not begin by being anti anything. The process of open consideration and examination will ultimately establish whether something exists or not. And when you see results like this. You find people that were supposedly unable to, you know, they were hidden and they were completely missing from whatever we would call reality. And all of a sudden the psychic says, here they are. That's a clue. Something's happening. And you guys, um, we're going to have to let you go, but we'll, I want to come back when you and Russell get together and have a date for the release of the film. Because I think you're going to have a fabulous turnout and a lot of curious people who would like to see what's been going on. Well, thank, thank you. I mean, people can go to our website at thirdeyespies.com. Um, you know, they can check out my uh, my other website at wakinguniverse.com. And just find us on Facebook, Third Eye Spies. Just look us up and, and you know, get, get involved. Okay. I'm going to blog this stuff on wendyscoffeehouse.com so you can keep up, too. Thanks for listening. Keep an open mind.